thank you welcome uh, thanks for joining i was just saying to our guest speakers we've had over 200 and uh, uh, well, then 220 people registered for, the, for this event, which is fantastic. I'm sure not everyone can join us on this call today, um, but we are going to um, imagine that you are all with us because we'll be sharing this recording after this session. So, uh, yeah, thanks for joining. I'm Pete Waddingham. I'm the Net Zero Lead for the Academic Health Science Network. Uh, welcome to this Energy Innovation <laughs> Share and Learn event. Um, we've got some brilliant speakers uh, and I'm just going to uh, have five or ten minutes um, introducing some rationale of why we've put this event on and some very brief context. Um, I will give you a flavour of the speakers um, uh, and just some of the areas that they're going to be speaking about. And I'm going to run a quick poll as well. Uh, and that's what I'm going to do in the sort of five or ten minutes that I've got. I'd love it if you wanted to, to put your name, your role, your organisation in the chat, if you want to connect. Uh, we've got a Q&A tab as well at the, the top of Teams where you can put some Q&As. I got in trouble on a webinar the other day for hijacking the chat and putting stuff down, but I'd love you to do that because I really want you to collaborate on this event. Uh, so feel free to do that. Now, well, let's just start off with this very quick poll, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and it shouldn't take too long. Um, but I'd just like to, um, I'd just like to, you to give us a fl flavour of which organisation best describes. Is she actually? Sorry, can people just put their mics on mute? Sorry, um, normally does that as standard. But yes, please, if you wouldn't mind just uh, responding to this quick poll. I do the same because otherwise it won't clear off my screen. Lovely, that shouldn't take us too long. Excellent, thank you for doing that. We've had 44 <laughs> responses. Uh, they will just keep going up, I'm sure, when I've clicked done. So thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, energy, brilliant topic, really important topic. Um, I stumbled across this um, uh, report that's only just hot off the press, January 2023, by the International Energy Agency. Um, I would encourage you to go and have a look at the website if you haven't. It's really, really good. It gives that very broad perspective on energy. Um, so I'm just going to quickly uh, read this bit at the bottom. But the energy world is in, a, is in the early phase of new industrial age, the age of clean energy technology manufacturing. Um, some of these were in the infancy, such as PV and wind. Um, and, and batteries, but now this is mushrooming. We're seeing lots more of this and the scale and significance of these and other clean energy industries are set for further growth. And um, please, as I say, go and check out that report. It does give a good sort of world view on energy and all the different areas that it touches on. Um, but I just, um, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about the NHS because that, you know, that's what we're here to talk about today and the supply chain. Some of you might have seen this um, uh, infographic before and I'm sure some of our speakers might touch on it as well. Um, but the NHS, to get to net zero, needs to look at its own um, scope one and two emissions, which we know energy is a big part of that. But also the supply chain that supports the NHS, it's got a big carbon footprint and we need to take um, our uh, and reduce our carbon emissions by some quite significant numbers. In fact, equivalent to the emissions profile of Croatia. And we know that healthcare buildings account maybe for about 15 percent of the total NHS carbon footprint. Um, and I was just looking at some other work, actually. This was um, a proportion of global warming potential of an average Swiss hospital done on quite a few hospitals. And again, you can kind of see on that left hand side where heating's 26 percent, electricity now, and then we've got 15 percent of the building infrastructure. So there'll be a lot of energy that's going into those sectors uh, and those areas. But actually, there's probably energy going into uh, every other part uh, around that that infographic as well. So it's a really important topic and someone sent me the other day um, uh, an article about digital, about the amount of energy that's being used for our digital carbon footprint. Now, I'm a big fan of digital and data um, I, I like topics like AI and I've been experimenting with AI. This people might have heard of ChatGPT3 that's uh, been released by OpenAI. So for me, data is not going to go away. It's only going to get bigger. We've got more of this consumption, but we need to make sure that the energy that supports this data uh, are from sustainable sources. So, um, you know, I, I'm fairly of the mindset that data is not a bad thing, um, but, but the energy that we're using to to um, uh, harvest that data and support that data is not helping the planet. So just really some quick key messages from me. Um, energy is not just about buildings. Obviously, we've got this this issue of data uh, of digital, but but yeah, keeping the heating on, the lighting, the equipment run, and cooling are all going to be essential. And saying that latter one with with temperatures rising, like we've experienced in the summer months recently, 
Um, the energy use of the NHS supply chain is fundamental, hence why I wanted to put this event on for both the NHS and its supply chain. We need to help the supply chain reach net zero, otherwise we can't reach net zero. Um, energy security is obviously a big topic. We've seen that on the news. We hear lots about that, but I've, I've kind of thought, you know, there's a lot of, as I say, transition to digital. So we need that energy being secure for our digital infrastructure as well. And finally, as I said, climate adaptation is really, really important. And so how we create energy, use energy, where we get it from in this changing climate, um, you know, needs to be well thought through. So some really, really quick key messages from me of, of why I wanted to put this uh, very important topic on. Uh, but I'm not the expert in this, and so therefore I brought some experts with me. So we're going to hear from Ian Stenton. He's going to give an overview of the NHS Estates Net Zero Plan. He's the National Sustainability Programme Manager at NHS England. I brought en Eric Neveld and Colin Black, who are going to look at some lessons from the energy sector. So I was really keen to bring other people's perspective into this uh, discussion today. And um, hopefully we've got Christine St. John Cox on the call. She's from the Energy Systems Catapult, and uh, she'll be talking about some of the work that they've already done around challenges to the energy transition. Uh, myself and Gareth uh, from the HSN Network, I'm going to just explain very, very briefly who the HSN Network are, because many of you might not uh, be aware of our role, so we'll, we'll just spend a bit of time doing that. And then we brought three organisations with us just to showcase some work. Uh, so Dr Lee Yao, who's the co-founder of, uh, or the founder of uh, Q Energy, Lee McCarthy at Clade, uh, and Stuart Watkin and Steve Taylor are going to be talking about coolnomics. Um, and then last but not least, I've brought some uh, colleagues that I've worked with and known for many years from the NHS, Craig Wilson, who's the head of sustainability, uh, talking about, again, some challenges of delivering energy and estate projects in the NHS. And I always use Craig's judgment. He's a good, trusted source of information. Uh, and same with Mark. You know, Mark's the head of sustainability at Hull Hospitals. He's going to talk a little bit about the work with the on site solar farm and, and potentially as well some other challenges. Uh, and it's a, a site I know well because it's my local hospital on my doorstep. So just before I hand over to the speakers, just wanted to do something really, really quickly and talk about my energy story, uh, energy story. Back in 2015, I had some solar panels put on my roof. There's my roof there. You can see my solar panels. I used a company that installed them for free. I didn't have to pay a penny. But what that meant is I could use the electricity while it's being generated. Any excess would go into the grid. I wouldn't get money for that. Uh, the company would. Um, it's helped my energy behaviour. Like today, it's a beautiful sunny day. So, you know, if there's things been turned on appliances, heavy appliances, etc. Um, you know, that 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 is kind of free energy. And, and today on a glorious day, it will be free energy. And um, I'm constantly having to turn the kids off, lights off and things like that. I'm sure others have, have got a similar situation. So I've got some smart uh, technology in my home. It's not brilliant and I need to maybe think about others. And I've not really had to think much about those um, solar panels, to be honest with you. They've been fairly low maintenance since 2015. I've not had to do anything with them. Um, on the left is the dashboard that I get from the company. Very basic dashboard. It tells me my you know, previous seven day usage. Uh, so those, those solar panels over the last 88 months have created 27 kilowatts, uh, 27,000 kilowatts uh, of energy, which is 11 tonnes of CO2 saved. Uh, but it's a very basic dashboard. And in the middle is my dashboard from my energy company. And again, it's a bit basic, to be honest with you. It's not really that good to... Um, to assess you know how the thing is going so i've got this real limited data to inform the return on investments the benefit and comparison to similar households and um, i i am starting to consider other options i looked at heat pumps but the government grant's not available for the size of the house i'm unsure about other solutions what might be a good return on investment suitable for the space that i've got so it's not always easy for me to find information about what works and how to seek help and obviously i've got well like many of us very busy sort of lifestyles with kids and things so it's difficult to find the time to assess and look at options uh, my father-in-law is brilliant. He's a really good trusted source of knowledge. He's just installed a battery storage system on his solar system. He's also got ground source heater and he's even built his own solar water heater because he's a bit of a, uh, well, he's a natural entrepreneur and he, he likes to do his own thing. So he's a really good trusted source. So why am I telling you all this information? Well, for me, there's kind of six areas. You know, funding is obviously uh, a, a, a bit of a, a barrier for me or trying to understand what the options are and how I can get the right return investment. Data, as I said, I'm quite, you know, I'm a bit unsure. What is it working? How can I maximise it? So data is really important. Those dashboards I'm using, a bit clunky, not giving me what I need. Time, as I said, trusted sources, smart IoT and, and case studies. So what I'd love you to do is one last quick poll before I hand over to my um, speakers. From your organisation's perspective, I just want you to put those areas in order where you think uh, you might need the most support. Now, if there's another area that I've totally missed, please put in the uh, in the chat uh, what that other area is. 
um, and just start the uh, the word with other. Um, just bear with me a second. There we go. I'm just going to launch that poll. So you just need to use your brains a little bit and try and drag them into order of priority. So in order of the highest to lowest, which of these areas would support your organisation for implementing implementation of energy solutions? Um, and as I said, if it's other that comes top or if there's other things that I've missed as well, please put them in the chat and just start your answer with other. And I will do the same as well. And then that will go off my screen. Lovely. Good. Right. We must rattle on. So thank you for doing that. And I'm going to hand over to Ian Stenton, who's the National Sustainability Programme Manager at NHS England. Thanks, Ian. Great. Thanks, Pete. Right, I'll just share my screen now and go through the slides. So I'm going to do an update on um, what we've been doing um, nationally, some of the documents that we've got out and the, and the support that we've um, we've been provided to trusts. So let me start. OK, so um, as Pete said, I'm the National Sustainability Programme Manager and I sit in the National Estates and Facilities team. So just for um, the benefit of people from from the NHS, um, there's confusion about we're part of the Greener NHS programme. How does that work? And it must be even more confusing for people outside of the NHS. So on the left hand side is um, the National Estates and Facilities team were part of the Commercial Directorate in NHS England and responsible for everything to do with estates and facilities really. So um, the HTMs and the HBMs, which are technical and building notes, which talk about car park and Legionella, um, everything to do with the estates. The team also includes the, um, the capital team that review large capital projects. Um, and approve them and then we've got um, delivery and strategy so delivery is our um, regional leads and um, ICS leads as part of the estates team there's sustainability and workforce so that's me and my team and we work really closely with the greener NHS and deliver the estates and facilities function for them so the greener NHS um, has the remit for the whole of the net zero. So when Pete showed that slide before talking about scope one, two and three emissions, Greener NHS sets the targets and the actions to help the NHS to get there. We deliver the programme for them for estates and facilities and then there are other teams that deliver programmes for travel and transport, food um, and then supply chain. So that's a, a big one that we all work really closely with about how suppliers for goods and services into the NHS can support us to get to net zero. So from our perspective, one of the key documents that we've delivered is the estate's net zero carbon delivery plan. This came out a year after delivering a net zero NHS report and really shows how the estate, the NHS estates can work towards the 2040 net zero target that's been set for core emissions and the 2045 target for supply chain. Covers um, six main themes. And the main one is about investing in our building. So we know that um, through build, building energy improvements and, and building energy efficiency, we can drastically reduce the carbon emissions that come from a state and the delivering net zero NHS report clearly sets out the where the carbon emissions come from from the NHS and particularly for core emissions, building energy is one of the, the bigger ones. We've also got looking at um, circular economy, so how we can reduce um, the amount of waste and, and, and turn waste into um, a resource. Electrification of fleet and committing to active travel do overlap with the travel and transport net zero team and they're doing loads of work, particularly around um, owned and leased fleeces, look at um, leased fleets, looking at um, ambulances particularly and how they can move to electric. Um, but from an estate's perspective, the estates often are the teams that are responsible for the infrastructure, installing infrastructure for EV. So that's part of the, the delivery plan. I say supply chain is key. I th think for estates, we, we look at mostly at construction, waste, outsourced FM and food and catering. So there's some really big um, suppliers and supply chain emissions that are related to estates and facilities. So how can we work with trusts, regions um, and the net zero supply chain team to um, to reduce the emissions. Apologies, the, the, the bin, the bin, bin wagons just come all through through the presentation, which is 
always seems to happen. Um, and then the last one that we cover is, um, again, what Pete referred to about climate change adaptation. So how do um, NHS buildings and the services that estates and facilities provide, how do they become prepared for more frequent hot, dry summers, more frequent wet, uh, wetter and warmer winters and extreme weather events? So what can we be investing now to reduce the, um, the impact further down the line? So this um, summary report was published in October 2021 and then last October we published the technical annex um, and this goes into much more detail about the six themes that are within the, um, the, the summary report and it sets really clear targets from 2022 right up to 2032. So the Delivering Net Zero NHS report set a target of 80% reduction in, em in core emissions by 2032. So that's why we've gone up to that day because the 80% target, particularly when we're looking at things like building energy, um, building, building energy will have to have moved away from fossil fuels if any NHS trust is going to meet its 80% tar reduction target by 2032. So the actions cover the six themes um, and their actions in, in that tech annex for um, trusts and um, foundation trusts, for us as the national team, Team for ICSs and regional teams and also for primary care and we just set out everything that we think that um, the NHS estate will need to do in order to be able to meet the 2032 target and eventually the, the 2040 target as well as just a list of actions the technical annex goes into much more detail about some of the data that we've got behind it because um, UCL did loads of work regarding the um, delivering net zero report about the scale of the challenge and some of the costs and that's all pulled in there. So I'd encourage anyone from the NHS to register for the, the future collaboration hub where you can, you can um, get more on that. So that's the, the main guidance that we've put out. So how do we encourage people to, um, to get to it, to understand it and to be able to work towards targets? So the main one is that we've set up regional estate delivery groups. So these are different from the greener NHS regional groups because they cover the whole remit of sustainability and net zero. The regional estates groups are focused just really on um, energy and engineering and waste and resources. So working with the seven regions to give trusts the, the tools and the knowledge to be able to focus particularly on heat decarbonisation plans to move away from fossil fuel heating and also to focus on the upcoming um, clinical waste strategy and the updated waste guidance that's due out shortly, which has targets about waste segregation and, and zero to landfill and things like that. So these groups are all set up. They meet every six weeks and um, some of them are only just on the second meeting. So we're still very much in the um, delivery phase where we as a central team are telling um, people directly in trust about the actions coming up. And then the idea is that these will all um, become hubs where we can learn from each other. Um, Tom, who's our innovation lead, who, who couldn't make it today, he um, will be able to take case studies of best practice and see where we can scale them up regionally or where they can become national case studies. And, and the idea is that this will be our, um, our direct route into trust so that they're aware of what we're asking them to do nationally. And then um, we're getting really good feedback about um, what we need to do to support them. One of the other things that we're doing is a trust visit process. So we go out to trusts. We're trying to do about two or three visits a month. We've done um, two so far this month. And we, it, we, when we go out to visit the trusts, we go through all the data that we have as the national team about them, check that it makes sense and see that it's right. And then go through these actions that are in the technical annex all the way up to 2032 to see um, where trusts are up to, if the actions are achievable, if they've already um, done some of them and what else, what other support they need from us. So this is some of the data that we get from them. Um, so, so that we get um, centrally, which is model hospital. So this takes a lot of data from Eric and you're able to compare um, anything to do with energy waste um, and the estate against um, different peer groups. So this is part of the data that we share with, um, with trusts as we go to see them. The third thing that we're doing to try and um, help to um, normalise all the actions that we're putting out and get people to, to understand them, to work towards them, is about developing the future workforce. So I've been really lucky as part of the Greener NHS, we got funding for net zero energy apprentices. So these are um, band three roles that are doing a level three, two year apprenticeship for junior energy management. We got um, Neve started at Leeds in July and Charlie started at Northampton in November. 
and um, we've received funding for another two um, that are just um, held up in recruitment approvals but these will be people that um, are managed by me and paid for by the central team but are actually based in hospitals so they get an oversight of both and the idea is to to grow new skills um, traditionally um, a lot of the people on this call who've been working for the NHS for years you always have to have a, a master's and and have experience to um, work in sustainability for the NHS so we're trying to get a different route so people who don't want to go to university at, at the start of the career that they can come um, and supportive with our net zero journey as well. So that's the key overview. The other do I'll just go through a couple of slides about some other documents that we put out. So in July, we had the um, lease the state guide. So this is for the NHS as a, a landlord or a tenant. And it just looks at some of the different things that you can put into um, into leases that you have and um, to try and work towards net zero. So there's some, uh, the suite of provisions are pretty um, generic and um, not mandated, but things that you can work together with your landlord or your tenant to help with net, move towards net zero. The M memorandum of understanding data is more for um, people who got um, relationships with NHS property services. Uh, and then the actual clauses that if you were drafting a, a lease, um, these have been um, done by a legal firm for us. So stuff that you can put in to try and work towards the, the, the lease to state moving towards um, net zero. We also work really closely with trusts that have benefited from the public sector decarbonisation scheme. Um, so um, the NHS was really, really successful for 3A that was announced in May earlier this year. Got about 59% of the overall funds, so well over £300 million. And we have regular meetings with the trust to receive that money and, and regular meetings with um, Salix, who, who managed the scheme, to um, see where we can support them where people need to, to make sure the schemes are all fully delivered. Um, and then phase 3B was opened in October and just to hearing round about now. So we're hoping by the end of this month, we'll have some positive news on the number of NHS trusts that were um, successful for 3B. And this is funding specifically for the removal of fossil fuel heating. So a uh, really, really, um, key to, to move towards net zero. We've been doing some work as well about trusts that use oil for primary heating. So there were two trusts that use coal for primary heating. They were both removed through PSDS1 and, and two of the five sites that we identified last year have got funding through PSDS to remove their oil boilers. Um, and Marion and team's been working towards um, how we can um, support the rest of the trust to, to get rid of them as well. So that's a long term plan action to remove oil and coal from um, primary heating sources, not for backup generation. We've got a bit of work on um, data as well. So um, all trusts that have half hourly meters have signed letters of authority so that we can access that data directly from the energy producers um, so that we've got a national overview of what's happening. Um, next year we'll be looking at potentially AMRs and non half hourly um, so that it reduces data burden for trust and gives us more of a, an oversight of what's going on as well. And then last minute, a, Ian. Sorry okay, yeah, I've minute, only got one you. slide. I've, I'm, pretty, I'm doing pretty good. Cheers, Pete. Um, and then we've got a um, digital twin programme as well. So that's with the Countess of Chester where they're mapping some of the key areas of the building. And I know some other trusts um, like York have been using digital twin as well. And then the last slide for me is just about our innovation program. So pulling all this together. So we work really closely with Pete and the AHS ends, but we have our own internal innovation process as well. This is very much looked at looking at um, companies who want to access the NHS or who are in the NHS and want to scale up rather than them having to go from trust to trust or rather than trusts having to review potential innovations um, themselves. We've got the, a, set, a central process. Um, so that's where they're reviewed against all the, um, the criteria you can see on the thing. So desirability, feasibility and viability, just focusing on the states and just focusing on net zero. Um, but that's um, some more info and Tom's emails on there. So when we share the slides, if anybody um, outside the NHS wants to um, get in touch or anyone uh, internally in the NHS who thinks they're doing great stuff, then get in touch. And that is me yeah. doing right. I'll stop like, sharing. Thanks, Pete. Very kind of you. I did warn all our speakers that it's a, a, a fast and furious event today. So thank you, Ian. Um, well, let's keep moving on. I'm going to hand over to Eric uh, Neveld and Colin Black. Eric's the co-founder of the technology uh, platform ca technology catalog should I say and, and Colin is managing director of Ca Car John Energy 
and a UK partner of the tech platform as well. So hand over to both of you uh, and to give a bit of a lessons from the energy sector and how it can be supplied to the NHS. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sir Pete, and hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, Pete. So before I'll, I'll do this talk together with Colin. I'll start and then I'll hand over. So before starting technologycatalog.com, I worked at uh, Shell for many years in the last role as uh, Global Technology Deployment Manager, responsible for getting technologies deployed in Shell's assets across the globe. Uh, we managed to make impact in good times as well as in uh, bad times. And you see an uptake curve of technologies over the years that was in the role over time and on the right, the uh, oil price and impact was made when the oil price was high and when the oil price was low. But one of the challenges that we faced in those days was how to find the right tech. And actually that nicely linked to the introduction you gave at the start of this webinar, Pete. There are so many things out there <clears throat> and it's really challenging to find the right, the right technology. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are literally thousands of solutions on the market. And at some point in time, we start to think, hey, why is there actually not a platform that can help here? And a bit how surprised there wasn't such a platform. So we decided to leave Shell and start our own. And the platform that we launched, technologycatalog.com, is a bit similar to platforms we use in our daily life to find hotels and restaurants. For supplies, it's a way to create visibility 24 seven, and that way to attract buyers. And for end users, it helps to have technologies at your fingertips. It has grown nicely. And besides the global version of the platform, we also launched portals per country, including a portal for the UK, the UK energy technology platform. And that's also sponsored by a UK governmental organization. So for that part, I would like to hand over to Colin. Thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Pete said earlier, uh, I'm the uh, Managing Director of Cars on Energy. We're a technology deployment services company, <laughs> uh, and I'm involved with many different areas within the oil, gas and energy sector. Uh, we're, we're all uh, in the midst of uh, an energy trilemma. Uh, we face the challenges of making our energy secure, uh, and obviously the, the um, a disaster in, in Ukraine and the issues around that has really brought that home about the energy security. Uh, we also know uh, about affordability, that's a key area. And what we're discussing today is very much about the energy needs to be clean, energy transition to zero. And so we're all in this together. Um, as the Offshore Energies UK uh, organisation, I chaired the Efficiency Task Force and what we found was that, like Eric had said earlier, and what he'd experienced in his, his past uh, work career at Shell, there was a lack of visibility of field proven technology. Um, lots of things in the internet about new, new stuff, but what about what's already out there? What is, what is there that I can deploy tomorrow, um, uh, or you know, t today or tomorrow, but not three, four, five years out, uh, blue sky thinking? So uh, I reached out uh, across the world to find if that uh, uh, platform existed. I found it in Australia, in National Energy Resource of Australia, and I asked if they would collaborate with the UK. Um, and they said no. Um, <laughs> they said they were actually, the, the platform was designed by um, Eric and his team. So I reached out to Eric and we've collaborated together and created the UK Energy Technology Platform which is, Eric has said, has grown significantly over the last few years. Uh, next slide, Eric. So within the energy sector um, and certainly within the oil and gas part of that, we are regulated by the North Sea Transition Authority. And so they have eight specific areas um, relating to exploration, production and decommissioning within the sector. So we aligned the platform uh, and exactly as Eric had mentioned about how much information is out there. It's much easier to put it into categories so that we can clearly define it. So if you needed to know something about uh, facilities management, uh, you could click on there and you'd find 186 uh, different solutions. 
So that was a key area that we looked at, but we also share a lot of the same technology challenges as you do within the NHS. So uh, data and digital, the need for net zero, emissions reduction, uh, heat, uh, power sources, they're all very much the same things. So you'll find a number of different technologies very relevant to the NHS sector within the platform. Uh, next slide, Eric. So one of the, the, the key things was that the regulator uh, identified that they liked the work that we'd been doing, but the pace needed to be so much more. We have the, the target of net zero by 2050, but also OUK have a target of 2035. So we really need to get after this. So we needed to, to some support. And through the, the funding uh, contract with the N North Sea Transition Authority, it's free for UK co energy companies and for UK suppliers to access the platform. And today we can reach out and say that all of the people on the call today can also access the platform for free um, at the moment, as long as it's funded from there. And you can, if from an H NHS point of view, you can look at it and uh, sign up for an Explorer uh, subscription. And all the suppliers on the call today can sign up for a starter subscription, and that will be free and covered by the Transition Authority. Next slide, please. So what does a technology page look like? Um, looks uh, at the face of it like a very busy slide, um, but this is years and years of experience Eric, myself, we've deployed over a thousand technologies. This is the information that you need when you select a technology. There's always going to be that sales pitch from the supplier. Um, you sit in a meeting and wonder, well, is this the right solution for me? The way it works in reality is that the first thing you want to know is, has it been deployed before? We're not in a position today to be a first mover, so we want to be a fast follower. So the first thing that people want to know is, has it been deployed? Then they want to know is, what's the relative business impact? How will it impact on, on our company, our organization, and how does it meet uh, our key objectives? From then, it's there about, you know, what exactly is the technology? What are the pros and cons? Because there always are some cons. It's track record, it's a business impact. All of this is uh, laid out in one page and very easily accessible. You can then reach out uh, directly and have a look. Um, with this particular technology, and we spoke about it earlier of digital twins, we can see that this company, A3D, have a 47% reduction on on-site um, visits and 75% of their, their data is reused, uh, significant savings on that front. Um, next slide, Eric. When we when we dig into this technology a little bit deeper, we find that actually they are already working in the NHS. They're working on a geothermal project at the moment, which allow them to a um, work along with the engineering team and the geothermal company and the NHS facility. But in a much greater scheme, once they've got the digital twin. Like uh, Ian had mentioned earlier, it has got so many other uses as well. Um, and also, not only has it um, had significant benefits from there and uh, reducing health and safety risk, but it's also significantly reduced the carbon footprint. Um, you can see further details of this technology on the platform or reach out directly to Colin Pittman, who is um, one of the directors of that. Next slide, Eric. And because there will be a big focus, obviously, on facilities uh, and infrastructure here, we've uh, selected one of the technologies it's also on, uh, this uh, Naked Energy uh, Virtue Hot. And they've, again, uh, while it's not specifically been in NHS at the moment, they have done quite a few uh, buildings. Here's the British Library with significant uh, impact, 3.5. Uh, times the carbon saving. 
lots of uh, impact there, uh, really exciting technology. And again, I'd encourage you to have a look um, uh, later on by going on the site. And Eric, uh, the next slide, please. So I've given you just a really whistle stop tour. It's, it's um, as I said, we've, we've made it free for you to access. So take your time, go back through it again, have a look at the site, pick out the technologies. Um, this is the UK energy technology side of things that we focused on. But on a bigger scale, the global site, technologycatalog.com, has really broken it down into producers of the energy and also consumers of the energy. And there's even more uh, technologies on there. Um, you'll also, the site, if you go under the section of resources, you'll find really insightful webinars on how people have deployed the technology, methodologies for deploying technology, and how to build a business case. Um, that's really uh, all we we're going to share with you today. As Pete said earlier, this is a, purely an overview to introduce you. Uh, happy to, to share any learnings um, across the energy sector in the future. Lovely, and, and that's exactly what I'm sure people will um, would want from you, Colin. So thank you for, uh, in fact, getting us a little bit ahead of time. I'm going to keep moving through, um, but just a, a quick reminder, please put either on the Q&A tab or the chat anything that you want from people or any questions. I can see some questions and answers going in already, so that's brilliant. Uh, Christine, I'm going to hand over to you next. Let's say, well, let's get ahead of uh, schedule. I'm going to shorten your uh, job title, if you don't mind, just to head of, head of Modern Energy Partners at the Energy Systems Catapult. But I know your job title is a little bit longer than that. But thanks for joining us, Christine. Really looking forward to hearing from you. No problems. Thank you. Right. So uh, we might be ahead of schedule, but by the time I've connected my slides, we might be back behind. Let's try. Have you got uh, that? All good. All good. Yeah. yeah good to go. Great. Great. Right. OK, so I wanted to just talk to you about Modern Energy Partners a little bit. Um, so the first thing that I thought I'd do is just introduce the Catapult, just so that everybody knows um, and understands who we are. So I'm from the Energy Systems Catapult. Um, we're one of the nine catapults that were set up after the Hauser review that Bayes commissioned back in, I think, 2015, maybe even earlier than that. And what it identified was that um, when looking at international models of how to unlock issues and uh, try and focus on decarbonisation or other innovative areas that needed transformation, um, there was a role to be played by an organisation that could focus on um, linking uh, academia um, with manufacturing and um, uh, accelerate innovation um, and having people focus on particular areas. So, so now there's nine of these catapults and you can see on the right hand side, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but it reflects the different um, areas that there are. So there are some which look at other medical activities in a clinical perspective, but of course today what we're looking at is um, uh, from my perspective, the operational side. So how do you decarbonise the operations? And that's where we fit because the energy systems catapult is looking at the transition of what's required within the energy system. Um, now, um, we like to think about it as a whole system issue. So you can see here, you know, we've got massive, great big energy infrastructure. It was it was set up a bit like um, our, our bodies with hearts, which you would call power stations, reaching out into little tiny veins and arteries, go all the way down to capillaries um, and provide us with energy across the UK. But but as we transform into a low carbon um, situation, we aren't going to need those big power stations. Um, we're getting rid of our coal and our gas. And what we actually have is a lot more sort of localised generation. So, so the whole of that sort of system needs to change in itself. And, and so does the way in which we think about power ourselves. So, so that's what we do. We try and work out as at a national level what the system needs to do. But, but actually, when you start thinking about it at a macro level in a house, um, uh, in a site like a hospital or even in a local community, how could that look and what would need to happen? Um, and so that's our key focal point. So, so um, then rolling it up into why is it relevant for the NHS? So um, uh, back in 2018 19, um, we got involved in the, an innovation programme, trying to think about how we could transform the public sector, how it could be decarbonised in a um, 
consistent uh, scaled fashion that would lead to um, all sorts of other benefits <clears throat> above and beyond what you would see through the site, you know, creation of jobs, um, the acceleration of the uptake of certain technologies which could drive prices so that you could see, you know, innovative technologies coming up the TRL much faster because of their adoption through the public sector. Um, we wanted to look as the pilot at 42 different sites. Um, they were split roughly a third, a third, a third. You can see here 13 hospitals, about 4% of English hospitals, but we actually covered some in all of the other different devolved nations as well. Um, and subsequently, we've done quite a lot in Scotland to try and understand a bit more about how hospitals operate. Um, uh, it's fair to say that it was a industry activity. You can see the number of different organisations that supported us. Um, anyone that's here today that's related or is working with any any of them, they are, you know, it's been a massive thank you. It's been very collaborative. Everyone's wanted to work together. And I like to think that it is, you know, a programme of learning for industry with industry. Um, what we what we tried to do with three core activities, so you can see that on the right hand side, we worked on four pathfinder sites, so sites that we actually took through a sort of decarbonisation process. We looked at what a heat decarbonisation plan would be, and then we started to take forward some of the very basic measures that would be in the early pathway, trying to um, test out how easy it was, what the supply chain looked like, whether or not good value for money was going to be achieved. And actually, interestingly, what were the variations in the different sectors? that we looked at was it going to be different for a hospital to a prison to a to a military site I can tell you off off the off the top of my head that it's about three times as expensive to change a light fitting in a prison as it is on a military site in a hospital somewhere in between so there's all sorts of learnings that came out of that um, that helped us explore what would be right what would be wrong what where we would best practice need to end up um, we also put together a further 24 decarbonisation plans. So what we tried to do was to try and work out how you could do it repeatedly, more and more rapidly. What would you learn? What patterns were there that, that would teach us about what the issues were going to be across the whole of the hospital sort of sector in the UK? How, how are we going to know and understand what technologies to deploy? Um, what would feel roughly OK and, and how would that fit together? Um, and then finally, and most importantly, what we actually realised was that there was a massive paucity of data and where there was data, people weren't using it. So we actually took forward um, uh, all of the sites to try and develop a sort of strategy about how you could um, identify and uh, mark out what sort of submetering would be required consistently. And then we actually deployed it to 23 sites. In the end, I think we had about 1600 metres collected. So. Um, what did we learn from the NHS? So I put this slide in because I think this tells you quite a lot about what we found. So of the nine hospitals that we did deep dive decarbonisation plans, you can see that there were some very clear patterns. Seven of them had steam systems. And um, when you're in the world of decarbonisation, that is actually quite challenging because um, at the moment, the, the lead technology, there are many technologies that would be applicable, but the lead technology that most people are thinking about is heat pumps moving to electrification. And of course, that presents an issue because uh, heat pumps operate on very low grade um, energy, but also present low um, output temperature, hot water. And the wider the temp temperature differential, the better. So when you're talking about steam, which is over 100 degrees and you've got pipe work and emitters that are sized for that, you've got a substantial challenge when you want to drop the temperature of the water that's flowing around and you still want to maintain the uh, temperature of what you've got happening. So, so that was something that we identified as a, a big issue um, and a challenge for everybody, not necessarily just one or two of the hospitals. The other big learning was that quite a lot of the hospitals that we worked with were locked into um, commercial agreements that meant that they couldn't do very much work um, until uh, they were going to be able to exit out of those agreements. Um, typically, they were towards the end of the next decade um, due to a 15 or 20 year agreement that they had put in place, often with CHP. 
Um, and CHP, obviously, as the grid decarbonizes, no longer becomes carbon beneficial. Um, you know, there are arguments about when that will happen. We know that the emissions factor is predicted to drop below that of natural gas for electricity by about 26, 27. So only, you know, what is it now? Four, four, four ish years away. But actually, um, you know, when you take into the efficiencies of CHP, you could actually be in a position now if you modeled it that you would be uh, actually additioning, uh, adding to your carbon burden. So, so we, we, we came to realise that there were quite a lot of CHPs in place, but also some big issues around um, how they were dealt with. You can see the sort of typical costs, but obviously that's relevant to the size of the uh, hospital that you've got, whether you're based in an urban area or whether you're in rural areas. You've got a massive advantage if you're in a rural area to be able to deal with um, uh, generation on site, and that obviously benefits you. So what could an overall pathway look like? So we realised that you don't just do one fit out all at once. Um, you're likely to want to do bits and pieces over time as things come to the end of their life. So this was a diagram that we drew up for each of the different sites that we worked on. This is actually um, Freeman Hospital up in Newcastle. Um, they've got one commercially operated CHP and one trust owned one, which comes to the end of its life um, actually last year. So, so they were actually in a position where they can do something about their own hospital, um, CHP, but then they still got to wait for some time to actually deal with the other one. Um, in every instance, we saw that all the basic, you know, energy efficiency measures, which make total sense, were not completed. Uh, hospitals were further ahead than anyone else. But what we realised is that actually there could be substantially um, more done in every situation um, with LED lights not being complete, you know, perhaps part of the estate being completed, but not all of it um, and controls being improved. Um, so there was some very basic stuff that could be taken forward straight away. Sadly, that's not part of PSDS funding anymore. Um, you know, it's focusing on the heat plant, but it does make sense financially. So therefore it could be undertaken. Um, in most instances, we found that there were building fabric upgrades that could be delivered. And the reason that we found that was that obviously when you're dealing with steam, actually economically, whilst the business case for um, putting a building fabric upgrade in is quite long, when you take into account, you know, the size of the heat pump that you might need to have, the issues that you might have with, you know, changing your heat circulation and your emitters. Um, it makes sense to actually reduce down the heat load that you've got. We also looked at things like transitional um, technology. So do you keep a gas boiler in at the same time as putting in a heat pump so that you've got them complementing each other um, so that you can uh, manage and cope with some of the additional heat demand? Um, and in every instance, we found that installing as much renewable energy as possible was going to support the economics, the financial benefit of the situation. So putting that in and getting that going. The, the realisation, obviously, is that, that um, you have a challenge to deal with um, in terms of when your PV is generating power and when you actually need it in the winter. So there was also a big issue around understanding and exploring network constraints um, across the prison estate that we looked at. Roughly a third of them were network constrained already. A third had issues. Um, that if they added any much uh, more load on that they would have a problem and the remainder were OK. So that gave a sort of proportionate feel to what we could we could understand would happen as we moved across the whole of the public sector estate. Right. Um, I expect I'm talking a bit too much, so I'm going to just uh, skip over this slide. But just, just to say, you know, don't worry about the text. All of the slides can come out afterwards. But we found that there was a sort of cycle in which the order of the different things that you needed to consider needed to be done in to make sure that you right sized and optimised everything. So dealing with those no regrets and building fabric, dealing with the heat pumps and the network um condition the heat network condition but then thinking about network constraints any additional ev charge points and then supplementing it with the renewables generation and thinking about demand profiles and whether storage would be suitable data was quite interesting and we uh connected to about 1600 meters about 400 of those were fiscal meters um and uh the remainder were sub meters we found that a lot of the hospitals that we connected to had existing sub metering maybe a hangover from crc um it was great to see we often saw people having a huge amount of sub meters we came across one hospital with nearly 400 sub meters 
um, but not knowing what they were serving, not actually monitoring them or doing anything with it. And I wanted to just put this graph in here because it really does show the purpose of collating lots of data together for different types. So this is um, prisons again. Um, uh, as you will know, there are different categories of prisons. Um, category A is the most secure. Category D is a, an open prison. Um, and what you can see here um, are B's and C's uh, for these top ones. Uh, so the purple, the turquoise, the blue, the yellow and the navy blue. And actually the lower profile are those of category D prisons. And I think that that really shows you what's going on, um, that there's a different profile of the different activities that would happen dependent on uh, what type of prison you're in. So imagine what that would look like if we were able to do it for hospitals. Um, we have got quite a lot of the hospital data from those that we were connected to, but if anyone else is up for sharing their data um, and helping us learn a bit more, that would be fantastic. The output of what we've been able to put together is half hourly benchmarks, which show what's happening over a 24 hour period, which of course, when you're putting together your decarbonisation plan is absolutely what you need to make sure that what you're doing mirrors actually what your demand is. It also helps you with your energy management as well. Um, in terms of skills and capability, now um, we came to realise that actually uh, one of the challenges of scaled decarbonisation is going to be the number of people that know what they're doing um, and uh, building that knowledge and capacity. So not only in the energy experts, you know, so your energy officer, your energy management uh, uh, engineer, whatever you want to call them, um, but also in the people that are actually delivering the work across the board. So you can see here where we actually found that there was the effort being put in was in the project managers who are overseeing the delivery. So, you know, making sure that they know and understand all of the issues and what you're actually trying to drive for will help prevent issues arising. Um, an example would be where a QS uh, on one of the pieces of work that we were working on selected a lower cost option for some LED replacement. Of course, the lower cost option didn't offer the same um, carbon reduction and the same benefits. It had separate PIR um, modules rather than integrated and it didn't deliver the same um, financial benefits. So whilst he saved some money for the capital project, what he didn't understand is that he was, wasn't going to save as much money in the longer term. So those sorts of things really need to be understood by everybody that's involved in the project. Right now then where are we now? So last uh, one or two slides. Um, the public sector decarbonisation project that we worked on Modern Energy Partners has uh, evolved. Uh, we're no longer testing things out quite in the same way that we we were. We're doing smaller projects. So um, I mentioned that we've been working up in, in Scotland looking at NHS trusts there and we're still doing some military work as well. But what we're also doing is providing guidance. So all of the learning and the insights that we gained from working with industry um, and with yourselves, um, we are generating into a series of guidance documents that are designed to complement the public sector decarbonisation scheme, the low carbon skills fund, um, and have been commissioned by the Bayes team that uh, are delivering those funding rounds. Um, we're building up to launching it. Uh, it's going to be covering seven key themes, we're calling them, and you can see what they are here. So they go from uh, putting together your strategic plan to actually working all the way through from a feasibility and design, all the way through the procurement, the funding, the installing of a project, commissioning it and handing it over, and then finally monitoring um, how much benefit it is actually delivering for you. So um, we're looking to try and launch that in February, a uh, little bit of a sales pitch here, but we'd love it if you could have a look at it. We want to know and understand your feedback and make sure that what we have put together is actually useful um, um, if it's not, then tell us and we can work on um, putting together the guidance that would help you. Um, we've obviously got technical guides, but we've also got, you know, how do you write the best business case? How do you model things? Where can you seek funding? What sort of things would you write in a business case? All right. That's Lovely. it from me. Very kind of you. Good. And we, we are bang on track and I'm going to go next if that's all right to keep the flow. So thanks for that, Christine. So much no information in this webinar. It's brilliant. Really, really good. And um, I can see people wanting to connect and get comments there. Look, excellent slide deck. So uh, no problems with your shameless plug because we're all doing that. I'm about to do the same. Oops, oh, not that one. Sorry. Well, um, I'm about to do the same myself. 
So I'm Pete Waddingham. Um, for those that have just joined a bit late, I'm the net zero lead for the Academic Health Science Network. This slide deck is going to go right back to the beginning. Um, I'm supported by Gareth at UCL Partners who helped me to put this event together. Um, I'm just going to whip through those that I did earlier on. Um, I'm presuming everyone can see my screen now, can't we? And uh, yeah, yeah I'll go let me just whip through here. Good. I'm just going to spend five minutes talking about um, the, the HSN network. So we're a network of networks. Uh, let me just say that's the right one. Um, there's 15 HSNs up and down the country. I now work at a national level leading on net zero, um, but each individual HSN uh, supports innovators uh, and the NHS. I used to work for the Oxford and Humber HSN for four years, so I know the HSN network very well, um, but we try and spread healthcare innovation at pace and, and at scale. Uh, so that's just a little bit about the uh, the HSN. So yeah, we're seen as the innovation arm of the NHS. Uh, we try and be those catalysts for innovation and, and connect partners. And I'm hoping today you sense um, that we, we you know we do play that important role because there's some brilliant people out there. And, and actually, as we keep saying, finding them and connecting them is, is, is vitally important if we're going to achieve net zero. So I think we're very good at connecting people and trying to create that right environment and just having that collaboration um, you know, ethos. And as well, there's an innovation arm uh, with with the way that Ian's doing. So, you know, we can try and connect and collaborate and make sure we get the right innovation to the forefront. Um, the HSN network uh, are nicely referenced in the Greener NHS plan, which is which is really good. Uh, that shows that, that, that the, the NHS England Greener NHS team recognise and value the role that the academic health science networks play. Now, I'm just going to pick out a couple of areas. Uh, and as it says there, this is not a comprehensive list. So please do connect with your local HSN or via me. I can help uh, get you to the right people. But what do we do? Well, we help innovators understand the system pull as well is one of the key areas. So as we've heard today, there's lots of strategies out there and, you know, and, uh, you know, trying to understand what, what it is that we're achieving. So if I'm an innovator and I need to speak in the NHS language, you know, getting hold of Ian's um, strategic plan is vitally important so we can connect some of these um, uh, solutions that we've got to what actually the NHS needs. So we try and help innovators understand that. We help them develop, therefore, their value propositions, you know, to be able to articulate what innovation they've got and how it's going to solve an NHS's problem, which sounds really basic, but it's so fundamental. Um, we uh, we provide insights to the NHS on, on what innovations are out there. So we often do a lot of horizon scans and connect people. So we do a lot of that work. Um, we try and connect innovators with system partners. I can see some of this happening in the chat as well, but we do that as well. Uh, and we conduct real world evaluations on some of the innovations that we're deploying. So as I said, that's not a comprehensive list, but the one I just wanted to touch on was around identification and support with funding, because it's so important to make some of this um, work embedded. And um, as Ian mentioned, there was the Salix funding that was very, uh, you know, public decarbonisation schemes. So I'm not making reference to that. Um, but I just picked out a few that have, that have happened recently. One of them, in fact, was the closing date yesterday. But it was 150,000 for an artificial intelligence decarbonisation innovation programme. That'd be prime for some of the innovators that we're working with and, and some of the areas that you've heard. Um, there's money again around, uh, there's a big net zero fund, 7 million, that's a, a very uh, location specific. It's for York and North Yorkshire area. But actually, there's a couple of um, areas that are looking at energy is one of them. Again, that might be primed for the supply chain of the NHS, maybe not so much the NHS, but our innovators that we're working as, as well. Small pots of money like this i for i um, uh, grant that's just come out, uh, and that supports with a very specific question. And, and we know that i for i would be really keen on net zero. So if you're an innovator and you want a little bit more evidence to support how your innovation can contribute to net zero, that small money might be ideal just to get you over the line and, and to build that business case. And last, this one looks a little bit grand, 70 million. It's actually that's the total pot of money, but that's for an industrial energy transformation fund. There's three areas that they'll fund. Um, and I think some of them are, are relevant, again, to the NHS's supply chain, so not necessarily the NHS, but they focus on data centres, those that are doing waste uh, and recycling of waste, and the last is manufacturing. Now, it's really loose because when you look at the standard industrial classifications that they're using for manufacturing, it covers every area. So, of course, the NHS supply chain and manufacturing things, um, and, and there's some brilliant money there available to decarbonise your energy infrastructure. Um, it's an ever-changing landscape, so um, the local HSNs have a good funding bulletin, so if you sign up to us as HSNs, you'll get connected to their funding bulletins. Obviously, being part of this as well, we can make the connection, so we'll try and make sure that you're aware of what this funding is available. 
Um, we Horizon Scan, I mean, I've been keeping an eye on the um, uh, UK Infrastructure Bank for a couple of years now. Um, have a look on the website, follow them on social media. Again, you can see where they're investing their money. Some interesting um, deployments happening in some local authorities, certainly in the Yorkshire region. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's uh, you know, that's what the UK Infrastructure Bank was set up. £22 billion of infrastructure finance to tackle climate change for both the public sector and private initiatives. It's worth having a look. I'm just going to do a really quick shout out to Barclays Eagle Labs. Um, I'm, I'm hoping they might be on the call, actually. Um, and I only stumbled, I've, I've known Barclays Eagle Labs for about four years. I used to be in an office, a hot desk office with them. And, and certainly the Auction Humber HSN are working with them on their health tech. But they've got an energy tech ecosystem. Uh, and again, this, the, you know, there's investors and, and uh, innovators that they're trying to connect with. And I'm hoping that we can make some connections with Barclays Eagle Labs, energy tech sector uh, and the green tech sector to start looking and thinking more about and um, uh, you know the financial landscape as well and just the innovation and um, i've got a landing uh, a bookmark bar actually i mean this is just an example on this particular one if you search for funding there's 22 bookmarks as of now so if i find things as well i'll put them on there i'll share it in the chat equally you can search on things like energy you'd find the energy uk catalog that we talked about today you'd find things that are to do with energy that i've found so it's a bit of an informal list but you never know what you might stumble across and um, so thank you i think that's everything that i just wanted to say uh, today because i do want to keep to term and I'll hand over to Dr. Li Yao, who's the founder of Q Energy, uh, which is one of the innovators that the HSN is supporting through the Digital North programme. Um, so hopefully Dr. Li Yao's on the call. I know his colleague Hello. couldn't join because he was trying. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah, I can hear a yes, voice. Hi, there we go. Hi, lovely. This is actually VJ. I'm a ah, hi, VJ. partner of uh, Li. Um, so I'm just trying to turn on my camera, but Mark, uh, Moving on. Um, well, we can hear you. Um, yeah, that's fine. I, I've got some slides. Um, I will present my slides. Uh, thank you. Uh, second. Are you able to see my screen at all? Uh, we're not, unfortunately, at the moment. Just one second. What I might do, BJ, just try one more time, but if it doesn't work, I'll shift the order around and I'll email you after this because probably uh, what I need to do yeah. is add you to... Uh, oh, there we go. We were on. We're good. We're good to go. Lovely. Yeah. All right. Yes, yeah, sorry uh, for, obviously, I, want, uh, I was going to have uh, George, uh, who has been leading the work with uh, NHS uh, from our team to do this uh, uh, slides, but uh, unfortunately, he's away. Uh, so, so you're able to see my screen, yeah? Okay. Um, yeah, we can. So obviously, um, uh, myself, uh, VJ, um, uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Q Energy. Um, so let's just uh, straight get into um, the, uh, you know, the, the what's the problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, obviously, as we are all aware of, uh, the, the, the climate tri climate crisis. There's also energy cost crisis uh, because of the reliance on fossil fuels. So we need to decarbonize and we need to move away from dependence on fossil fuels and then move to more uh, renewable methods of, uh, uh, you know, source of energy. And uh, Q Energy uh, is all about helping people uh, achieve the net zero uh, emissions uh, by we use a data driven approach to do that. Um, we are a, a startup. We first we started uh, to work on this uh, from 2017, but really got going from 2018. We're based in Manchester. Uh, we based currently in the Manchester University Science Park. Um, so we were involved in. Um, so my, my background, Lee's background, is coming from the Internet of Things, um, monitoring uh, low-cost devices and low-cost devices for control. Uh, uh, smart city kind of background. Uh, work within smart buildings, uh, and then obviously George is, uh, has years of experience on energy management. He's worked with uh, Bruntwood, one of the large pro property companies in Manchester and the north of England. Um, so obviously we're all coming together to say how, how can we solve these problems um, by using this um, in Internet of Things approach. So we, where we We've just lost you, VJ, I think. Uh, sounds gone, hasn't it? And the presentation, so it must have kicked out. Um, 
What we'll do, uh, just to keep to time, I think probably I'm going to have to hand over to Lee, if that's OK, who's the Major Accounts Director at Cleared. Lee, are you on the call? I can see you there, Lee. Is it OK if I hand over to you, please? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can, yeah. Perfect. OK, bear with me. Caught me out while I was frantically changing some slides. <laughs> <laughs> Don't right. worry, you know. Team, well, good morning and, and thank you very much for hosting me on this uh, today. Uh, very much appreciated the, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. So very quickly, um, you know, an introduction to Clade. We are a primarily, originally a refrigeration company, uh, 36 years experience operating in the UK market. All the major retailers are using uh, Clade products somewhere within their systems. Um, and we sort of pivoted into the heat pump sector about seven years ago as well. So we're, we're operating the two lines. Uh, we're a UK manufacturing company, offices in Bristol uh, and a manufacturing uh, plant up in Leeds. Um, interestingly, that piece about refrigeration, 36 years experience, um, we are very much about natural refrigerants. And I'll come on to a little bit more about why uh, in due course. Um, the refrigeration sector moved primarily almost wholesale into natural refrigerants a good few years ago um, and what we're seeing now is um, and what we're really pushing for is that transition in the heat pump sector as well because there's a lot of good reasons to be using natural refrigerants um, th this is probably teaching you all to suck eggs a bit we absolutely understand uh, the uk's decarbonization journey but important i think important to point out how much of that carbon footprint is down to the production of heat um, and brackets cooling as well, because that includes sort of air conditioning and, and cooling systems. Um, and to decarbonize that 37%, that huge sector, um, it's, it's widely now proven and I think accepted that amongst all those other technologies that are out there, heat pumps are very much at the forefront of sort of buying out that, 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 those fossil fuels. Um, and indeed the 2020, I think it was white paper by the government did actually say, and now whilst this is kind of aimed at the domestic market, it does sweep up public buildings as well. This grow from installing about 30,000 heat pumps per year up to 600,000 heat pumps per year by 2028. Um, alarming to consider that I think in the first year when we should have been delivering, you know, 30 to 50,000 heat pumps a year, I think the figure was closer to five to 10. Um, so we're already behind that uh, sort of delivery line. But Heat pumps, I think, are very much coming. Not always right, but in a lot of cases, are the right the right technology to apply. So, if if the if the right decision for you is a heat pump, um, and of course there are, as I said, there's cases where it might not be. Um, which heat pump is it? Well, of course, the first thing to do is to get good advice. And there's a little caveat, a little warning around this. And I think I think it was sort of touched on by Christine as well earlier. And whilst this is quite a new technology, there's a lot of consultants out there who have been in the sort of the, the heating engineer game for a while who, who still don't fully understand it. So there is a little bit of a warning around going to a consultant and asking for a solution for a particular problem, because unfortunately what we've seen in some cases is they specify what they already know as opposed to what they think might be coming in the future. So I think the, first, the, the, the warning in that is when you talk to someone for the advice on heat pumps, talk to people who know and don't just automatically assume that the usual consultant you speak to will have that knowledge about the uh, current technologies. Um, also brought up recently, and of course, very, very uh, true and needs consideration is the fabric upgrade to buildings. Um, there are cases where it just won't work, um, but there are also a lot of cases where it, it can work. So, and I understand the, the, the caution and the wariness around low delta T's and low temperature delivery of heat pumps. Uh, but I'll come on to a little bit more detail about uh, why perhaps natural refrigerants are in a better place than some people might expect. So also you need a heat pump that's going to be future proof. And this, this is playing into this area of natural refrigerants versus F-gas regulated refrigerant systems. Um, and we've all seen the news recently about how, you know, F-gas stuff is, is now tri, excuse my, if I get this wrong, trifluoroacetate. Acid, I think, is now one of the PFAS chemical byproducts, which is being found in watercourses and animals. Um, and uh, the, the danger is those synthetic F-gas refrigerants are going to be regulated out. More about that in a minute. 
The right heat pump for the job. Uh, we'll talk very briefly about the efficiencies, um, the flow and return temperatures, and the uh, the COPs, the coefficients of performance. Uh, a bit about data, built-in uh, grid flexibility options, and how to fund the project. That whole thing around PSDS and finance options. Um, and I'm just jotting down very quickly here when we did that initial poll about what are the things that would help you um, address the new technology, funding, data, expertise, case studies, et cetera. Those are the things that hopefully I think I've ticked off within this short slide deck. So why natural refrigerants? Well, okay, so nat refrigerants generally are broken down into two areas. You've got the F-gas regulated synthetics and the natural refrigerants, which are carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons, and ammonia. Um, the that, that little table just gives you a you know green is good, amber is agnostic, and red is bad. Uh, little tick box exercise of of the uh, the characteristics of those refrigerants. Natural refrigerants, important to note, are not regulated under the F gas system. So a little bit of history, you know, CFCs were the first F gas regulated refrigerants. Uh, actually, the first refrigerants we used were natural refrigerants when the first fridge systems were invented in sort of, sort of like 1812. Um, but then synthetic refrigerants took over. So CFCs for years uh, were used and and, were, and are now banned. But of course, that we, we discovered that they were very harmful to the ozone layer. So we developed HFCs. That brought the problem down a bit. It left the ozone layer al alone, but we started heating the planet. Uh, and now the next generation are called HFOs. Uh, and they they are now producing the trifluoroacetate acids, the PFAS enduring chemicals, and we're realising that they are absolutely uh, polluting and damaging the Earth's surface. So what we've steadily done over the years is just brought the problem down from 20 kilometres up right down to the to, to the surface of the planet. Um, natural refrigerants have none of those effects, um, and indeed it's a little bit ironic because we talk about reducing carbon dioxide, but CO2 is perhaps the refrigerant of choice. Um, and because it has a, a comparable value of one kilogram equals one unit of uh, global warming potential, synthetic refrigerants are all into the hundreds and thousands above uh, that, that, that level of, uh, of damage. Uh, and this is widely accepted. You know, there's a lot going on in the press at the moment and some quite alarming studies are starting to reveal the, the damaging nature of those F gas. Um, refrigerants. So there's a choice to be made. You know, we can specify synthetic um, heat pump systems or we can go with the naturals. And there is a very, you know, it's a very quick sort of comparison chart of absolutely why clay deals in the natural refrigerant side. So what's the catch? Well, you know, you know morally, it's the right thing to do. So people are saying, well, OK, but that probably means they're not performing well. Well, I think it's contrary, the, the complete opposite to that. The, the two green pillars are the two natural refrigerants on here uh, to be aware of. Uh, and you can see at the flow and return temperatures, which are across the bottom of the graph. So basically 50 in the first column is the outflow temperature. 30 would be the return temperature from the heating system that you've got. And there's a few different examples of those flows and returns. Um, all measured at a five degree ambient temperature, which is a good sort of base mark for uh, UK seasonal operation. Um, and there we go. You know, in, in all cases, the natural refrigerant can outperform, can outperform a synthetic. On the left here is the coefficient of performance. So this is the magic about a heat pump. Um, what a heat pump is not doing is generating heat. Um, you know, any fossil fuel that we burn can never be more than 100 percent efficient because of course you lose efficiency in the process of destroying something to create heat what a heat pump is very cleverly doing is transferring heat from outside inside through a refrigerant process so through compression through evaporation um, we manage to transfer heat out of ambient air and actually then increase it and release it inside hence we get an efficiency of up to three and in some cases 400 percent so for every one unit of electricity used to generate heat we can create 400 uh sorry four units of heat to be delivered inside 
So looking at the design of a system, um, three major areas that affect the performance and design of any heating system. So firstly, the ambient temperature in which you're operating. And this is quite important to consider. This is this affects your choice of refrigerant. It affects your voice, your choice of heat pump, um, and this can change quite quite dramatically, even within the UK, of course. So uh, a property in Scotland is going to have a very different ambient profile to a property in uh, Cornwall. Um, the refrigerant and heat pump choice um, very important to match the capabilities to the requirements. We saw the chart of the different performances at different temperatures. So we need to look at the system and understand uh, what the requirement is and then match the refrigerant capability and the heat pump capability to those performance charts. Um, and bear in mind, it's about what we call the seasonal coefficient of performance, not an immediate coefficient of performance. So what that means is when we look across the ambience of the year, for instance, the number of days that we're operating at perhaps minus five, minus six, where the electrical dem demand will be higher for the uh, heat pump to maintain its uh, target heat. Over the season, over the year, those days are in the minority. So most of the time we're operating above freezing. Uh, you know, ambient of five is a good one to look at where the operating temperature is uh, optimal. Uh, and therefore, the seasonal coefficient performance is is the figure that we, be sh we should be interested in. Lee, can I just give you a one minute so, warning, if that's OK, please? Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Thank you. So the heating system performance as well is um, that's the heating side, the emitters. And as Christine said, you know, where we're looking at high temperature situations, we may need to be changing um, heat emitters. We need to be considering the fabric upgrades and we need to maximise efficiencies. We're, what we can do when we're looking at maximising efficiencies, if you've got a cooling requirement and a heating requirement, we can use the waste product of each um, to therefore boost the performance of the other. So a cooling system generates heat and a heating system generates cool. Why on earth would we not look to operate both? And I know the NHS estate makes much use of both. I'll skip that one. Um, grid flexibility, another consideration. This comes into that data piece, that whole sort of question around the digital side. Um, very clever stuff nowadays predicts what the weather is going to be tomorrow. It predicts what your demand is going to be. And through grid flexibility and being clever about heating buffers in advance, we can save through uh, combination and agreements with our energy providers up to 20% of traditional bills. There is a case study. We'd be delighted to talk to anyone about that later. This is one powering a leisure centre. Um, and so the, the, the final one, the key takeaways. We need to change now. You know, the environment is demanding it. Seek the best advice when you go out to, get, you know, to start looking at a new heating system. Absolutely select a natural refrigerant. This will give you future proof technology and you won't end up with stranded assets. Um, select the right refrigerant and the heat pump combination and look at the data options that a provider uh, can give you. Lovely. Thanks for that, Lee. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, conscious of time, but appreciate you with wrapping up with some key messages and your contact details. Um, can I hand over to, I'm going to go in a slightly different order though, but I, I'm, I'm going to stick um, to, to the order that we originally went for, sorry, should I say, and and is Steve Taylor or Stuart Watkin on the line? Uh, Steve's the head of engineering uh, at NTH. Steve Taylor is the assistant director of states at NTH. We're going to talk about Coolnomics, which is uh, an innovation that uh, a couple of us are aware of, and I think it's getting some good traction in the NHS. So, Steve, I can see you on the call. Can I hand over to you, please? Yep, yep. So I'm here. Stuart's not with us today, so it's it's just me today. Um, so um, just a little bit of an, an introduction um, to start with. So I'm the Assistant Director of Estates and Capital uh, for NTH Solutions. So NTH Solutions is an, an NHS owned company um, and we provide the estates and facility services and procurement services um, for our trust, which is North Tees and Hartlepool Foundation Trust. Um, we are uh, considered as a, a medium sized acute hospital um, we have three hospital sites, but we fit into that that category from an Eric point of view. Um, I think probably similar to a, an awful lot of trusts out there. We've got a really old estate um, that was built in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, so on a daily basis, we are kind of wrestling with our backlog issues um, and keeping the hospitals safe and operational. Um, so and generally we're always limited with capital and the access to capital. Um, but against that background, we've still got the same um, targets of achieving um, the net zero carbon agenda. 
So our trust strategy is to meet an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 um, and then the 100% by 2040. So pretty much in, in line with the, the general NHS um, standard. So there's a huge amount of work we've got to do with all our sort of old plant um, and the like to decarbonise. Um, and um, we have a green plan. We have bids in with Salix as part of the, the current round of decarbonisation um, and all those sort of really big things. Um, but we know we've got to, you know, there isn't a kind of silver bullet that's going to get us to net zero carbon and we need to look at lots and lots of different solutions. Um, and some of these might provide us um, a bit of a sort of a leg up and a support to help us in the direction of net zero along the way. So um, I think Coolnomics kind of fits into that category. Um, and we came across this um, a couple of years ago um, um, and um, we reviewed our FGAS register. Um, oh, thanks, Jonathan. I don't know if you can make that any bigger, Jonathan. Um, as big as you can, please. But reviewing our FGAS register, you know, we recognise we've got an awful lot of old plant um, and it, it is an option. It was, you know, what can we do if we don't have the capital to just replace you know, 30, 40, 50 air conditioning units across the trust estate. What other things can we do to improve our energy efficiency and, and uh, reduce our carbon emissions? So we looked at Coolnomics and um, we wanted to find a kind of test site for it. Where, where could we give it a trial um, in an area where it was it was low risk from our point of view? Um, so we picked our um, and, and also had high demand in terms of cooling uh, requirement. So we picked our um, mattress wash area um, where the facilities team clean the mattresses that go onto the wards. It's a very hot environment um, and we have sort of four air conditioning units in that area and they pretty much run 24-7. Um, so we picked that location. The um, air conditioning units are, are kind of a mixed age as well. So we had um, one Mitsubishi 6.3 kilowatt unit, which is running on our 410A. Um, we had another Mitsubishi that was six kilowatt, again, running on our 410A. Um, we had a 10 kilowatt Mitsubishi on the same gas, but a little bit newer, was installed in 2010. Um, and then we had a Dakin 9.5 kilowatt unit running on R32 that was installed in 2019. So a bit of a mix of, of different air conditioning units. Um, and the the initial concept um, of Coolnomics was based on reducing energy consumption by improving the control um, of this plant. So we, we initially sort of questioned that in, in light of the sort of the rapid improvements in, in um, thermostatic and room controls. Um, such as, you know, I know Dakin have a, a particular product, a, a Maduka product. I'm sure other companies have others equally as good um, that, that are installed on, on, on modern equipment. Um, however, the, the engineering theory behind um, the Coolnomics is it, it, it's clear that the, the savings really are around reducing runtime of the compressor. Um, so while still providing sufficient cooling, um, it just meant that um, that we could still meet the, the needs of the room with a, a reduced compressor runtime, which means use less energy. Um, so um, compressors normally run right up until the temperature of the room is achieved. Um, but more often than not, the compressor refrigerant still has a cooling potential within it. Um, so the idea of Coolnomics is, is you shut off the compressor earlier, um, knowing that that residual amount of cooling capacity you've got um, to still meet the room temperature and that then saves your energy. So um, it's a fairly simple control system. It's a small little box, um, not much bigger than your hand, quite easy to install. Um, so we ran um, a trial with on that. So what we did was um, we ran in the mattress area on those four units that we talked about, we ran um, an energy consumption trial over four weeks just to see what energy do the, do the plant currently use in their current control system. Um, and then we ran another four week period um, using the Coolnomics controls and compared the two. Um, 
So um, we did that and we were quite surprised actually at, at the um, the saving that we achieved. Um, and um, we actually achieved a 33% saving in energy consumption, which which we really weren't expecting to achieve. Um, so that's circa for that for that bit of plant, that's circa two and a half thousand pound um, a year and four tons of carbon. Um, so quite significant. Um, we continued to uh, monitor uh, the operational use of those units and um, we made a few tweaks along the way, but we remained at about 15 to 20 kilowatt hours per day of, of, of energy saved. Um, so having done that trial um, and looking at our FGAS register, we, we think we probably got another four, 40 to 50 similar plant elsewhere within the trust um, that we could potentially roll out the use of Coolnomics. Um, and um, we think that Coolnomics does form part of our our route to net zero carbon. Um, so we'll we'll continue with that. Um, we think the units are, are quite easy to install as well, so we don't have you know major shutdowns um, and affecting clinical areas and significant disruption. So um, we we definitely think that uh, these units form a place in our route to net zero carbon. Um, so I think that's about it for me. I don't know whether you have time for questions, Pete. Or... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll leave questions because we've given people the option just yep. to put in either the chat or the Q&A &A yes. section. So I would encourage people to ask questions, but great great yep. work. And it's, it's it's great to see those reductions that you're having. And, and thank you for presenting that. Um, yeah, let's keep rattling through the uh, the speakers. I'm going to hand over to Craig Wilson, Group Head of Sustainability at the Northern Care Alliance. As I said at the beginning, um, Craig, I, I often use it. He's very technical as well. So I'm probably sure he was enjoying today. There's a lot of technical data to woven within these presentations but over to you Craig. Thanks Pete and uh, good morning everyone uh, so as Pete says I'm Craig Wilson I'm the group head of sustainability at the Northern Care Alliance uh, but I was I've recently moved across from Bradford Teaching Hospitals so when Pete put this to me a few weeks ago oops there it goes Pete can you see that is, is that coming through all right it is it is thank you yeah Perfect. So yeah, when Pete came across the the, the the week and sort of said, "Can you do a presentation for me?" It's like, where do you actually start with with this piece of work? It's absolutely huge when you start digging into it. And obviously, from this morning's presentations, you can see there's absolutely loads of things. So I've split it into four areas that we'll just quickly run through. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, I'll, I'll I'll I'm I'm trying with this presentation to give just an overall sort of view of some of the history and some of the bits and pieces that I've been involved with at Bradford and uh, with my time in the NHS uh, as well as the NCA but yeah just when you start building it up and building the picture up it's it's such a transformational change to the estate um, so so how do we start um, so I've been involved in quite a few roadmaps um, so trying to understand what technologies can be used to ensure that the trust is is fit for the future um, and then from, from both perspectives, uh, we, we looked then down the electrical infrastructure. Uh, so understanding how the challenge of understanding the, the, the capacity um, of, of the local infrastructure feeding your estates. And then ov obviously looking at the opportunities for renewable energy. And we've currently looking at um, working with local partners in terms of heat provisions at the moment, in terms of is, is the ways in which we, we could work and, and deliver um sort of that net zero position in terms of heat provisions and then there's also that corporate social responsibility for the populations that we serve so again not not sort of starving the electrical infrastructure in our areas of um the electricity um to, to serve our our building which then may cause uh, instability to the grid that, that that we take that power from and then f fundamentally uh, starving the, uh, the 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 grid um, and the local network to the uh, the population that we serve. So yeah, some of the opportunities. Uh, so so again, uh, being involved with heat decarbonisation and uh, at the NCA, we're looking at trying to build that into other ways of 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 um, looking at it in terms of um, when we're doing capital works. How do we how can we build a heat decarbonisation for for that change process? And then for the more complex estates, uh, so how do we how do we build in phasing? on-site, uh, off-site electrical loading capacity availability and then that that really technical specification to understand how how, how are we going to 
um, move the estate into a, a net zero position. And like I said, working with on-site and uh, local partners to investigate feasibilities. So I, I won't steal Mark's thunder in terms of available land nearby and things like that. Um, and then also heat provision, so heat networks and things like that, especially in some of the urban areas, um, looking at working with partners um, to, to try and alleviate some of the challenges. And then may, maybe a requirement for strengthening the grid. So do you have to move to away from that network and, and, and into a primary and a uh, primary supply and what what that impact will have both financially um, and then in terms of mitigating the risks in terms of that uh, power quality coming to your sites. So the next one is uh, a little bit of plan in terms of CQC in terms of getting it right the first time. So again there's a lot of uh, anxiousness and anxiety regarding what, when do you actually take that leap? Uh, how big a leap do you take as well? Do you take it for the whole site? Do you take it in a phased approach? Um, and then that then sort of tips over into oversizing, undersizing of the infrastructure. So have you taken into account everything that um, you need to to actually base um, your infrastructure of the future? So uh, again, we're looking at this transformational change which will last uh, on your estate for many, many years to come. So ensuring that it's the right size um, to, to make sure that uh, we're not oversizing, undersizing, which then creates inefficiencies. So at the moment, there's obviously limited capital uh, funding on, on, on programs. So how do we build uh, additional net zero uh, initiatives on top of um, a program of like a re-roof, for example? Um, how do you build that net zero piece in terms of adding additional insulation and fabric improvements? Um, and then also looking at how can we challenge the industry? So kind of building on what Ian was saying at the beginning, how can we challenge the industry to, to help us innovate? We, we know through the delivering the net zero NHS that we, we have to innovate to get to that net zero position in that pathway. So how can we open that opportunity for, for innovation? Um, because we, we truly need it. Uh, it's, the, it's the only way that we're gonna get to that zero position. So again, some of the opportunities, prioritizing uh, how, how to retrofit. So it, it, again, the fabric. So for, for a hospital um, and some of the hospitals that, that I work for, we've, we've got real problems in terms of uh, relocation. Uh, you've got very specialist wards, so you can't just relocate them to, to do uh, fur, fa fabric uh, refurbishments and bringing things into the net zero positions. So, so again, trying to prioritize things uh, where you're moving an ICU into a new department or a new a new wing of a building, um, ensuring that we get that that the, the things that are going to be very hard to retrofit in the future, and then think about life cycles. So things like lighting and things like that, life cycle um, will 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 change and and the technology will advance. So again, that prioritisation of of making sure that we 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 choose and and invest in in, in the hard to do in the future and allow that life cycling to take place in some of the technologies um, which then you'll then in install over the next uh, sort of 10 years. Master planning incorporating all future plans from internal and external stakeholders. This has been a really interesting project recently at one of our trust sites um, and building into how does that site operate and look in the future. Uh, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a minute. So in terms of decarbonisation strategies, is the decarbonisation strategy in the new estate strategy? Because everything that you do within the estate strategy has to decarbonise. Um, and then obviously the vital important part of that is, is injecting the clinical strategy into that uh, estate strategy. So it's, it's an all encompassing holistic approach. Opportunities for concept testing. So again, uh, taking some of I Ian's presentation earlier, how can we build on that innovations hubs and, and, and host innovation roadshows, for example, in terms of bringing academia and industry onto sites and showing them that this is where we got leakage. This is where um, we've got some real sort of uh, problems in terms of trying to get us to a net zero position and, and, and trying to uh, thrive in terms of the academia and industry. And then again, training users how to use it in terms of the, the, the um, especially with the innovative solutions uh, that they might not be used to in terms of moving away from a wet heating system uh, to a different approach. 
how can we ensure that, that approach is 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 well known and well used and again some of the innovative solutions maybe that um some more control is is is, is given locally um i've recently been um on a site uh, in a local university looking at how they're trying to innovate and, and move uh, to different ways of heating um which again if that was brought in would need would need additional training it's not through a bms um provision so the next one is really looking at vision 2050 so what, what i mean by this is um net zero and the climate change act means that everything's net zero by 2050 so how, how does that look on your estate so everything that's around us all the all the providers and partners that we work with and the contractors that we work with should all be in a net zero position so by putting yourself in that in that position what will it look like um so how will the estate function um what will be the clinical need again it's going to be very difficult but um, what are going to be the future specialities um in in there and future population health needs because that will really help you define um sort of the um, amount of uh, work that needs to be brought onto site so new builds etc but then also how do we need to retrofit some of the some of the other sites to to make them compliant and maybe uh, from 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 other perspectives uh, and how do we create an estate which is fit for the future so that's looking at adaptation uh, as well as mitigation and and developing uh, an estate which um, it, it is going to survive a net zero world and for for a long period to come we can't just invest for for, for 20 years we, we need to invest in and these estates and these health buildings will be here for a long time so we've just delivered at one of our first uh, hub and spoke models so for people that don't know hub and spoke is is is, is looking at uh, we've got a diagnostic and treatment center now off off our main site so again looking at the 20 20 minute neighborhoods and things like that creating convenient healthcare how how is that going to interact in the future um, and create convenience to the, the, the population that we serve. Again, going back into master planning, um, we, we, I've really found that valuable recently in terms of master planning, in terms of those discussions with, with commissioners and key stakeholders in terms of the future. What does the future hold and how can we build that into that net zero um, ambition and, 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 and drive forward? I think most people would 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 say that if I didn't cover finances and, and the capital and revenue revenue planning, um, it, it, it's it's a massive part of this uh, challenge. Um, so future energy costs, there's positives and negatives um, regarding budget setting and and project delivery um, because of the uh, current expensive costs. Some of the paybacks are are, are very short now. Um, like I put in the opportunities, we've got generation and other technologies which have got pay, paybacks that are shorter than they ever have been. Um, so there's some positives as well as some of the negatives in terms of capital. So some of the net zero, um, some of the net zero provisions don't have any or very long returns on investment. So how do as as, we, as providers choose and and, and prioritise and change our perspective on investments? Um, in terms of capital investments in the future. So d delivering a capital program um, with a different lens, a greener lens, a, a, a more carbon net zero lens, and then limited our, our, with limited capital funding, how does that net zero criteria have a higher priority? Um, so, so it pushes it up that list in terms of the, the spend profiles near the top. Last how minute, Craig, please. Yeah, yeah, no problems. Uh, so how do we incorporate other estates programs? So backlog maintenance and everything else in terms of that priority. Um, and, and, and that focus uh, and finance full, full trust uh, net zero transformation in the future. And then the longer term finance agreements, um, PFIs, energy performance contracts, how does that evolve um, and, and how does trusts finance some of the things going forward and then tackling the hidden costs, uh, asbestos, anti-ligature in, in pest control. Um, so as I say, there's, there is some, 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 some positives as well as negatives in terms of finances. And it's just making that balance and that that changing the focus slightly. So some innovations have other benefits, so healthier buildings and, and, and builder users instead of uh, reduction in cost. So again, trying to take the focus away from cost, but what's the other benefits to to the to the population that we serve or our workforce that are working in these buildings? And then reviewing the methodology and application project to inject schemes with um, sort of the, the net zero approach. Um, and then we need to re review funding streams and methods of, of, of decarbonizing our estate. So thank you very much.
No, thank you, Craig. I mean, you can sense just how much wealth of information is is, is there in your head and, and experience from previous projects. So thank you for sharing that. And um, Mark, let me hand over to you, um, Head of Sustainability at Hull Hospitals, uh, just to hear about some of the great work that you've been doing there, actually. Thank you, Pete. Hopefully there should be a presentation appearing. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, lovely, Mark. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much as, um, for the opportunity. My name is Mark Bowman, Head of Sustainability at Hull University Teaching Hospitals. Uh, I'll give you a look, quick overview of our organisation first and then move into our uh, PV scheme, which we delivered last year. Uh, so we're a large acute trust in based in the, the North and Yorkshire region. Uh, we have two main sites. Um, around eight and a half thousand uh, whole time equivalents with an income of circa 726 million and provide uh, general and specialist services to around 1.25 million people. Uh, so we have two quite different sites. One, Hull Royal Infirmary is a, an urban uh, city hospital, lots of high rise buildings, not much land around it, hemmed in by a railway line to the north and a main arterial road to the south. Uh, our other site, we're very fortunate it's a, a rural hospital site um, with a lot of green space and we're in the fortunate position of owning land uh, around this site which I'll come on to shortly. Uh, the Trust is really committed to uh, its net zero ambitions and has signed up and have a board agreed green plan to aspire to achieve net zero by 2030. Um, these are some of the objectives we've set out to help us on the way to achieving that journey. Uh, I won't go through them all in, in detail. So some of the reasons for us for a PV project uh, was the obvious benefit of creating a renewable energy source with the situations we've seen in energy markets of late. Obviously, by generating your own source of power on site, you reduce that exposure to market forces and have greater certainty over your revenue costs. It allows us to plan for the future better with understanding those costs uh, and also to try some of this renewable technology and see how it works. When we first set out on this scheme, we'd expected that it would probably save us somewhere in the region of about 600k a year. Um, with some of the rises that we saw in the energy market this year, that kind of went up to about 1.6 million. Uh, and obviously it, it fluctuates dependent on uh, the current costs in the market. So this is uh, our available land. So I said we're, we're very fortunate. Not all of this land is ours, but a good chunk of this land to the south of the Castle Hill site is owned by the trust uh, and is farmed by a tenant farmer that we have. Um, and that's one of the considerations we need to be aware of. So for a lot of PV development, tenant farmer and getting engaged with your tenant farmer early, particularly on long term contracts is key. Um, our contract was coming up for renewal uh, in the year prior, and this was a scheme that we'd looked at previously. Uh, I think it's worth pointing out we were very fortunate in getting funding through PSDS phase one, which was how we were available, uh, able to deliver this scheme. We got 12.6 million uh, as part of our phase one bid. So making sure you have a good relationship or a good contract with suitable break clauses with tenant farmers. Uh, engage with the planners early. So we got the planning officer down uh, long before we put in any submissions to understand what were the issues. Working with the um, parish council and local councillors as well to understand any concerns they might have had. Um, obviously the DNO is a key person to speak to about can the grid take this level of um, PV and generation capacity being installed on site. Do we need grid reinforcement? For us, we did need grid reinforcement. We ended up having to lay six kilometres of cable to the nearest available um, electrical substation to be able to support the installation of our PV field. Uh, access to site was key. It's off a small side road through uh, an urban development. So how do we work with the local residents to make sure we don't upset them? Um, needing new meters and uh, export agreements and contracts in place. Uh, for those that are interested, there's a little technical line drawing there just showing um, the land. We have two fields, field A and field B, along with an access road, which uh, also the electrical supply cable runs uh, parallel to that to link the two sites together to the main uh, transformer station. Uh, so for us, 
as I mentioned, we had the DNO connection uh, agreement in place. We needed to get that additional cable installed and laid. Um, because of the size of the installation, we had to install uh, a new supply point and get a new energy contract in place. Um, because we were crossing a, a road, we'd hoped we might be able to do some road closures. That wasn't the case, so we had to directional drill under a road. Um, because of the time of when we did this construction, we started in um, 2022. Uh, we'll come on to the timeline in a moment, um, but due to the fact that it was during the COVID period, we had a number of issues with panel supply, so we had to switch from one panel supply to another. Um, we also had uh, issues with the ground conditions for the steelwork. Uh, in the summer, uh, using piling rigs um, on rock hard ground is quite difficult, and then also having a winter phase as well, which meant that we were working on a, a very wet site. Uh, we also had some delays with our transformer supplies and deliveries coming across from um, Greece. So there was a little bit of programme slippage, but uh, on the whole, it was a really successful project, both on delivery um, and timeline. So we got our planning in, in February 2021. We received consent uh, as delegated authority in August 21. And I believe we started, um, I think we got the planning on the Friday and we managed to get the contractors on site for the following Monday. Uh, and we got both fields on site online for the second week of March uh, last year. Uh, our original aspiration was to try and get it for December, but because of the delays and issues in supply chain, we were a bit delayed with um, with those. Uh, so this is uh, one of our fields. So this is our field A, which is located uh, just south of the, the Castle Hill site. You can just see the site at the top of the image there. Uh, and this is our field B. Uh, field A is a traditional south facing array. Field B, you can see it looks slightly different. This is an east-west facing array, so it's much lower lying, but allows us to uh, benefit from getting generation much earlier in the morning um, and later into an evening. Um, the peak day output is more than we can currently utilise on the Castle Hill site. So we, um, at the moment, are exporting, but looking at how we can store or transfer that to our other site in the future. Uh, at the time of install, I believe this was the largest east-west array in England. Um, this was our power care from last year. Um, this was the first day that we actually came off grid completely. So we were coming off grid by about um, eight, nine o'clock in the morning. And during the summer, the Castle Hill site is completely powered by the PV field during the daytime. Uh, I had a quick check this morning. We're currently generating around a megawatt of power even during the winter uh, so it is helping to support our uh, the hospital really effectively. Um, field A, um, we have our grass cutters installed on site in uh, a small flock of sheep so a local farmer unfortunately who was based on the east coast had lost his field due to coastal erosion uh, and needed somewhere to put their sheep um, so we know his sheep now live on um, field A and it's a much uh, more cost effective way of keeping the grass down. Um, field B, we can't, we can't do that due to the low height. Um, and I think it's a nice way to show how traditional farming can also um, work with renewable technologies. Um, so some high level overviews of, of the project. Um, we've got 11,000 panels there and it generates a third of all the power requirements of the Castle Hill Hospital. As I said, it meets all of our daytime power needs during the summer. Um, and we're currently forecasting to, to generate 4.4 and a quarter million kilowatt hours. Um, it is outperforming our forecast so far, so we'll be keen to see how we outturn at the end of the year and how we've delivered that. Um, and the total project uh, came in at a cost of 4.2 million, so it's delivering a really quite attractive payback. Um, for us. And there you are, Pete. Thank you, Mark, for that. Really good. I mean, what an impressive timeline. Um, and again, like you said, you know, it's, it's nice to mix that, you know, farming with with some renewable energy. And I'm I'm sure those sheep will appreciate the shade in peak summer as well. Uh, lovely. Um, VJ, um, I'm hoping you haven't got technical difficulties. I can only give you five minutes, unfortunately, because I need five minutes yes. to wrap up myself. So I'm hoping you might jump to the slides. We don't need some yes. of the background, but jump straight into the Q Energy. Yeah, will do. Thank you.
just while yeah. DJ's, I oh, know we'll get where they can see it there. Lovely. Yeah, it's loaded up. Perfect. Yeah, just skip through some of those first slides, please, VJ. Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, sorry for the issues earlier. Yeah, as I mentioned, I think you do energy platform. Uh, we are about uh, using a data driven approach to help uh, customers reduce their carbon emissions and achieve net zero. So we start with collecting data and then from there we take the customer through the net zero journey. I think I'll skip slides and talk about um, uh, some of the actual work that we have done. Um, obviously we work with the uh, University of Manchester uh, NHS Foundation Trust where we have uh, got a project uh, which we completed uh, last year. So we replaced the existing gas boiler with the heat pump. Um, and then we also upgraded the uh, building management system with smart controls and we have installed a battery storage system. So the, the uh, so from the starting uh, from the monitoring of the data and then we found the uh, uh, recommendations for different net zero actions, uh, carbon reduction actions, which we executed with our partners. And uh, the key thing is now we are able to monitor the heat pump uh, and the building management system and all the meters on site. Um, and along with that and control our battery storage. So by coordinating all these assets together um, and we are able to reduce the charges on the electricity bill and able to do smart trading with the energy markets. This reduces the carbon emissions by reducing the carbon that is pulled from the grid when it, uh, when the, when, during interval periods and also delivers uh, cost savings. So. And here is just a snapshot. So the, the, this uh, small black box is our uh, low cost uh, QBOX IoT gateway, which we are able to monitor assets uh, and also able to control assets remotely. So uh, obviously in terms of partners, we, we, we are looking forward to work with uh, different partners of providing different net zero solutions. We, we are trying to be uh, the partner who can support in terms of data collection, monitoring and control uh, on the site. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, that's just the some of the screenshots from the dashboard. Um, and uh, obviously, currently we are also working with University of Hertfordshire, um, where we have connected with 50 buildings. We're working with Manchester Metropolitan University, Bank of China, who are all part of this net zero dashboard, and then taking them through a journey and optimizing their assets on site. Um, so in terms of the frameworks, currently uh, we work with contractors like Vital Energy and Boeing Energy Services to, who are on the existing frameworks. Um, so we invite you to evaluate the Q platform in your performance specifications um, and uh, looking forward for feedback from uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks, VJ. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to put you under so much pressure. Um, you know, it's great. Actually, that slide that you showed us as well around just how many customers you've got in different sectors, I think is really fascinating. And uh, as we've talked about throughout this presentation, uh, presentation today, data is absolutely key and fundamental. Thank you for doing that. Um, I need five minutes to wrap up. Um, I know there's some Q and A's in the chat, but I'm not going to answer them today. What we'll do is we'll follow up with them. We'll make sure speakers can answer the questions. We'll follow up in an email. Um, my colleague Gareth just wanted maybe to talk a couple of minutes for PV. Is there anything Gareth you wanted to mention uh, quickly? Uh I'll be I'll be really really quick just to sort Thank of you. reinforce. I thought Mark's story was excellent. Just yeah, to say absolutely. it's not it's not unique, but it's a really good example. I'm glad we could share it. I was talking to um, Tony Marsh from Milton Keynes. Uh, they haven't done an offsite one. They've done PV over their roofs. Um, his saving over the last um, couple of years has been two hundred and three thousand five hundred pounds in energy costs. Uh, his return on investment trajectory has gone from being nine point six years to being four point five years. His, the, the PV cells have produced 5% more power than they expected and their total servicing costs for the last year were £4,680 and that was to clean the, 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 the panels and, and the guttering. So it's just like this is working much better than they expected. They're getting more power, it's costing them less and that trend is likely to continue and they're looking at rolling out more. Uh, 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 they're running out of roof space is what's the story there. Um, and they're looking at tying that together with their sort of heat pumps as well. So it does feel like there's quite a bit of momentum going in, in, in this direction. It's not that we're waiting for technology. We've got technology. We've got to find mm -hmm. a way of getting it into place properly. And my last point, build on what, what um, Lee from Clade was saying, is the installation really matters. One size does not fit all. This is really a unique problem, and each site needs individual attention and thought. It's engineering. And it needs to be done well to work. 
one, you know, th there are no silver bullets here. You've got to do that system thinking. You've got to work the problem through and make sure you pick the right thing for your context. Lovely. Thanks for that, Gareth. Right. As I said, I'm going to wrap up now with five minutes remaining. I know we've had people join us at the beginning, had to leave, others join halfway through, but that's not a problem. We will send out the recording, we'll send out the slide. Um, I'm just going to um, ask you a quick question, very simply, and I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, people I've seen in the chat, you know, people are making connections, which, which is brilliant, but I'm hoping you did discover something new or made a connection that will add value to your work. So very simple, Paul. Um, if people wouldn't mind responding and uh, while you're doing that, I'll just wrap up, as I said, um, you know, we've we, we've been on a, a, a journey. We've had lots of uh, speakers. As I said, I'm, I, I try to put a lot uh, in this today and I almost feel like I need a bit of a debrief, which is not a problem. You know, we, we wanted to throw a lot at you today. Talked a bit about funding. We've talked about how to find innovation. We've talked about some of the challenges. We've talked about data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we've mentioned a little bit about our role as the HSN network and those that were on the call when I mentioned this, as I said, I think we're very good at knitting the system together. Um, I think that's an important role. And, and as we can see today, we've got so many great people doing brilliant things. I just wanted to put a bit of a plea out. I am um, again, as I said right at the beginning, I've experimented with uh, ChatGPT3 recently at the OpenAI product, uh, artificial intelligence solution that's really powerful. You can ask it questions. And one of the questions I asked it the other day was, uh, if I'm an innovator, what three uh, lessons could I uh, provide to people? But the third one was connection and collaboration. And that is vitally important. So as I said, I know we've thrown a lot of your information at you today, but please um, have a look at it. Connect with people that um, are sharing the information, the speakers that have shared their information. But more importantly, don't be frightened just to ask us. Ask us the questions. Do, do you know where this solution might be? Have you any idea about this funding? Could, have you got anyone that we could speak to about this? So I think throwing information at you is brilliant, but actually it doesn't take away that human element of just connecting and collaborating. So I just wanted to thank you for your time. I wanted to thank our speakers for their time. So much information in there. Lots of stuff for me to uh, ponder on and digest and I'll be following up on. Uh, and good. Uh, yes, I can see from the survey we've got people that are saying definitely, which I wanted to put that down and I can already see those connections being made. So please keep a focus on this topic. Please connect with me if you find anything of value. I don't think it'll be the last time you hear about us on this topic. I think it's so important uh, that we need to keep the focus up. Thank you to UCL partners who helped me with this today. Uh, Gareth and Elias, I can just see you in the bottom corner actually on my screen. Uh, UCL partners are one of the HSNs of the network. So thank you for that. And as I said, a, a big final thank you to all our speakers today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Unfortunately, the clouds just come over here, so my solar panels aren't going to be optimised right now. Uh, so I'll have to make sure that I don't use too much energy uh, this afternoon. But good to see you all and enjoy your weekend.